I, I just think our brains are not built for this. I think we've, the human beings have now outstripped what our brains were, were built for, and we're building systems that we don't know the consequences of. And, and more than that, we're, we're then building, almost in the way that we're talking about with, with carbohydrates, it's like we built an entire dietary system to provide to a piece of junk food that our body craves because it used to be rare in the wilderness. And I, I feel sugar's like, definitely that. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like that's that's exactly what's you happening. You used to have to fight bees for sugar. <laughs> you know, you paid a high price for it. <laughs> right, exactly. And and now I feel like that it's the same sort of thing with regard to social media and the metaverse and, and all this stuff. I think we're constructing worlds that are just designed for the, the sugar high and the dopamine release. And yeah. I'm, I'm afraid that we're going to live inside it. I was reading Robert Nozick the other day, um, and uh, he has this thing in... in, um, in man in uh, uh, trying to remember the name of his book uh, State and, and Anarchy uh, and um, he uh, he has something that he, he posits he calls the experience machine and his, his basic theory is that if you are if you are given the choice to live inside a machine where you get all of oh, the yes. feedback loops of, of pleasure and it feels real and, and all of this stuff you still wouldn't choose to live in it because you would understand that you're not having any real world impact but the problem is, what if everybody else is inside the experience machine with you? I think that, that the, the libertarian basis for society is kind of falling away because if, if everything... I think, you know, I think the problem with, with thought experiments like that is that they're actually not possible. Like, so, and I think that's actually a technical problem with, with conundrums like that. There's a conundrum, Claire Lehman talked to me about this, the editor of Quillette, she was <laughs> asked this question. It's, it's one of these philosophical conundrums, and so this is a rough one. So imagine that you're in Amsterdam during World War II and the Nazis are everywhere and you have a Jewish family in the attic and you're up there with a baby and there's 25 Nazi officers on the ground floor and the baby starts to cry. Do you smother the baby? You save all the people upstairs. And Claire, who is a mother of a very young child at that time, said her response was, don't ask me such stupid questions, which I think is actually the right response. Mm -hmm. And it, it's more embodied response, right? And, you, you can trap your philosophical cognition into weird corners, but that doesn't mean that your fundamental intuitions are flawed. Yeah, th th this is right. With this Nozick thing, it's, it's like, well, if you could not have a body, it's like, yeah, right. no. <laughs> You know, right. you're grounded out in the world. That, that's, that's the rejection of Derek Parfit, right? So Derek Parfit's entire moral theory is the, the trolley problems, and you can yeah, decide how right. morality is constructed based on trolley problems, and people are like, well, that's not really how morality is constructed. It's, it's, not, it's not all based on edge cases, it's right? not really how it's constructed at all. It has to be embodied, for example, and that's a crucial issue. You know? And so the, the notion that a set of semantic philosophical propositions, even coherently organized, constitutes the ethical world, and that ethics is top down from the semantic space mm -hmm. into the embodied mm -hmm. space. That's, there's some truth in that because there's feedback loops, right? We think about ethics and we can, we can move around the edges of ethics and so forth, but it's within a game that's already established. Mm -hmm. And that game is actually established through embodied negotiation first. So when you see Moses leading his people through the desert, they're all fighting and scrapping away. Right? And then he sits as judge of them for a very long period of time. It's months or years even. So much that his father-in-law says, you have to stop doing this because right. it's exhausting you. Right? It's after that he receives the revelations from on high. And so my sense of that psychologically is it's a story about the fact that morality is encoded in our behavior in a deep level. Mm -hmm. And so deep we actually don't understand the morality. But then now and then we get an imaginative insight into the moral pattern. Mm. And then we get a semantic representation of the imaginative insight. And that's this revelation. It's like, here's a moral rule. It's like wolves suddenly becoming semantically conscious of the authority relationships uh -huh. in their pack. Oh, that's really good. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. No, that's that's quite good. like 20 years to yeah, no. pick up, so <laughs> <laughs> put a lot really of effort good. into that. Yeah, no, there's a, there's, a, there's a big kind of rich debate in Jewish philosophy over whether Moses is right to listen to Jethro. So Jethro comes mm -hmm. in and says, you need, to, you need to devolve authority to lower levels. You need the, the princes, you need the judges of the tens and then the judges of the hundreds. Yeah, yeah, just, which is a lovely way of thinking about it too because they, they parse out the, I thought that's what should have happened in Iraq, right? Kill the tyranny. Well, what do you do? Well, you have to establish a hierarchical local authority. Yeah, exactly. So Jethro, the Centralized control doesn't work. But one, one of the big questions is whether in doing that is Moses setting the stage for all of the chaos that follows, because once you give up the authority that he has, the direct authority, mm -hmm. and you have now layers of, of, of authority below him, how much authority can you devolve to layers below you without giving up the, the prime authority at the top? Right? That is because like one of the cardinal questions of life, isn't it? You know, it, if you have a family, you want to devolve 
authority and facilitate autonomy. And the question is, how much can you do that without, without generating disunity? And I would say it depends on the value of the goal that unites you. And, and then that brings up another question, and this is a question I would say for the moral relativists. Um, I was talking to Rupert Sheldrake in, in Cambridge. He has lots of wild ideas, but I was conducting a seminar there on the nature of the uniting ideal. So it was imitation of the divine ideal. Mm -hmm. Say, so you need a higher order aim to unite subordinate drives. Mm -hmm. right? So the question then is what becomes the highest order ethic? Right. It's like the pyramid with a gold cap on the top, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or the Washington Monument with a pyramid on top of it with this aluminum cap on. Something's at the top, and the thing that's at the top is actually qualitatively distinctive from all the th things that are subordinate to it. So the question is, well, what's that highest order uniting principle? Mm -hmm. And, well, one answer to that, that the three religions that are based on books have proposed is it has something to do with the authority of the word. Mm -hmm. And Christianity, that's developed into the notion of the divine word. And you see that saturating Judaism as well. And that's at least in part because the thing that has to be superordinate is freedom of, it's, it's not freedom of thought exactly, it's more like freedom of consciousness because logos isn't thought. It's not logic right. either, it's much broader than that. It's more like consciousness itself. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think that's true technically is because Imagine that consciousness and attention are in some sense isomorphic, right? I mean, when we pay attention to something, we become conscious of it. Okay. Conscious is, consciousness is the mechanism that generates proximal solutions and dissolves and regenerates them. And so all the proximal solutions have to be made subordinate to respect for the process that generates all the... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Makes I, sense. Th I think it's a cardinal presupposition of psychotherapy because what you do in psychotherapy is you allow people maximal freedom of expression, right? You don't impose your views on them. Even, even the Freudians mm -hmm. use free association. Say whatever comes into your mind, and it turns out that that process of untrammeled expression in good faith is actually curative. It actually makes people better. It leads them to what they're afraid of. That, that's one of the consequences of, of free speech, right? Because you, you sort of, you tend to circulate around what bothers you and what disturbs you, and so untrammeled freedom of expression will lead you to the source of your fears, and then you can confront those fears, and then in confronting them, you can get more courageous. That's all part of it. Obviously, one of the, one of the big yeah. arguments that, that, is, that is used with regard to freedom of speech now is whether freedom of speech, can, if, it's if it threatens the structure of freedom of speech, freedom of speech. Yeah, can, right, right. right. That's the, one the of sort those of, weird loops. Right, exactly. Like the, 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 Germans loop. have, the Germans have an entire term for it, which they, they mm -hmm. stripe like our no democracy. No tolerance for intolerance. Right, exactly. Like, if it's a threat to the democracy, can you, mm -hmm. can you suppress the speech? And, well, I think, I, I thought about this a lot. I, mean, I think you can equate free speech with the struggling for truth, like mm -hmm. struggling towards truth. Because if you're speaking freely, you're, you're trying to investigate rather than to, to con convince or to claim, especially if it's, it's during exploration. So let's say that you're guided by the desire for the truth. So you've made a commitment in faith that exploring the truth is going to be curative in the broadest sense. Mm -hmm. And then you might say, well, is that the superordinate value? And I actually don't think it is. I think the superordinate value is love. And I think I, I've thought about how to define love sort of practically. Mm -hmm. I would say it's the best in me serving the best in you. That's one way of thinking about it. But it's also the desire that all things flourish to the degree that that's possible. And so you can imagine you have a fundamental orientation on life. It could be Mephistophelian in the Faustian sense. So Mephistopheles in Goethe's Faust, mm -hmm. he, he says this twice in the first volume and in the second volume. So Goethe was insisting on this Mephistophelian view. The suffering of being is so intolerable, it would be better if it was eradicated completely. That's the Mephistophelian view. Mm -hmm. And that's a powerful argument, you know. And I talked to Stephen Fry about God, and, mm -hmm. and, and Fry's very interested in mythology, very oriented mm -hmm. towards narrative, and he's a wise person. And he said, he was angry, and he said, well, I, I'd, call him all, I'd call him out for bone cancer in children. It's like, fair enough, you know, there's a lot of undeserved suffering in the world, and you might think, well, the whole bloody thing should be brought to a halt. My sense of that is if you pursue that path, you make everything worse. You don't make everything better. 
you start to become part of the process that generates the suffering you're objecting to. Mm -hmm. So you take the opposite of that viewpoint. It's like, no, we just, we want to make everything better for everyone, including our enemies. Mm -hmm. And that's the orientation. And so I would also say that's, a, that's faith. It's like, I'm going to act as if I wish that everything could be as good as it could be, and then maybe even better than that. Mm -hmm. right? And decide that being itself is worth the effort and, and the repair. And then inside that, then I think truth works because... But there has to be mutuality there, obviously. I mean, the person that you love absolutely. has to love you back, right? The, the, the sort of unrequited yeah. love you're talking about on a broad level, if it's only one way, you're going to end up giving an enormous amount of leverage to people who are not interested yeah, well, in Yeah, well, that I wouldn't call... That, that's why you have to be wise as a serpent, you know, <laughs> is that it, it does demand reciprocity. But I would say that if it's mature love and not naive love, and they're very, those are very different things. They're like the difference between naive trust and mature trust. Mm -hmm. Naive trust is everyone's out for the good of everyone and no one will ever <laughs> hurt me. That's naive trust. And you hit someone malevolent and that just blows into pieces. Right. It might bring you down like with it, you know, because a lot of people get traumatized by mm -hmm. malevolence. But courageous trust is, I know perfectly well you're full of snakes, just like me. But, you know, we can meet as men and women of goodwill and we can move towards the good together. And the freedom of our discourse will facilitate that. And if we orient ourselves properly, then we'll enter into a joint enterprise that's aimed towards the good. And that, that works.